I'm looking at Exodus chapter 16. And in Exodus chapter 16, what you have is the children of Israel murmuring against Moses. And you have the great story of the Lord raining down manna from heaven. The Lord supernaturally provides bread in the wilderness. Just like in Matthew 15, 33 through 38. Matthew 14, 15 through 21. And as he's going to do again in Revelation chapter 12. It's the bread falls from the sky. God supernaturally is taking care of his people, just as he promised. Then in the tribulation, Revelation 12, he's going to supernaturally take care of Israel during that time. That which hath been is that which shall be. So in chapter 16, you've got a murmuring against Moses. They're wanting something to eat, and then God comes through and rains down manna from heaven. But it says in verse 1, and they took their journey. So Israel took their journey. The saints walk is a journey. You think back to the first time you were saved, and it's been a journey. If you've done if you've been working for the Lord, then it has been a journey. You've met all kinds of people, you've done all kinds of things, you've learned a lot. The Christian life is a journey. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. It's funny, the name of their location matches their attitude of heart. The wilderness of sin. And that is what's in Israel's heart and mouth right now, because they're about to murmur against Moses. They came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And as we've said a hundred times, Egypt pictures the world. So they, uh, this is after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And just because you're out of the world doesn't mean you won't run into trouble. You see, you got saved. You got saved out of the world. But that doesn't mean you're not going to run into trouble into this world. They got out of, you got out of the world. You're still going to run into trouble. There's a lot of trouble that you're going to run into on this journey especially in the wilderness of sin and it says in the whole congregation of the children of israel murmured against moses and aaron in the wilderness but they really despised god not moses and aaron when you despise somebody that's just always doing what god wants to do always telling you to do what god wants you to do you're not really despising them you're despising the lord that's speaking through them they're murmuring against the lord look at 16 and verse 8 it says in 16 8 and moses said this shall be when the lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bled bread to the full for that the lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. You see, their murmurings are against the Lord, not against Moses and Aaron. You're, you're not really against the messenger. You're against the one that gave the message, the Lord. So this murmuring stuff, it's serious stuff. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 Here's and... Hey, look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 10, it says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Notice that, destroyed of the destroyer. That shows you how, how bad God hates murmuring. Look at Psalm 106.25. In Psalm 106, 25, it says, look at verse, we'll look at verse 24, Psalm 106, 24, Yea, they despise the pleasant land, they believe not his word, but murmured 
in their tents, and hearken not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in their lands. God doesn't like that murmuring. And you know what murmuring is? If you look up the definition of murmur, it's a, it says it's a low sound continued or continually repeated as that of a stream running in a stony channel or of that of a flame. It's, it's a complaint half suppressed or uttered in a low muttering voice. You know people that do that a lot. Just constantly complaining. You'll walk by them uh, uh, saying things under their breath about what's going on at the moment. They're never happy. They're never content. They can't be content. And Paul's always saying stuff like, you know, be content with such things as you have. He's learned, you know, whatever situation he's in, they're with to be content. He said godliness with contentment is great gain. You know how to stop murmuring and complaining. Just learn to be content with what you have. So they, these people are a bunch of murmurers, complainers. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Notice, they're, they're thinking about being back in Egypt, where they were serving with rigor and hard bondage under Pharaoh and working all that overtime for less than minimum wage. Sometimes you only remember the good from your past. Like, whatever, you're in this situation you're you've gotten yourself into because you're a a saint and you start thinking about how it was before you were saved but you only remember the good stuff when actually you forgot about all the baggage and bondage that came with serving in the world they're only remembering the good stuff it says when we sat by the flesh pots and we did eat bread to the full most likely, they really weren't eating all that great back then. They were probably just getting enough to get by. But the Lord, you see, he wants them to hunger a little bit so that they know they can't live by bread alone. Look at Deuteronomy 8.3. You see, if you never... If you never go through some suffering, then you just... You never realize certain things. But it says in Deuteronomy 8.3... It says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Yeah, he wanted them to hunger so that they would know that you can't live by bread alone. And if they wanted to die so bad, why does it matter if they die in the wilderness? It would be better than dying in Egypt. It would be better to die out there serving God, doing what God wants you to do, than to die in the world, doing not what God wants you to do. So it says in verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. For you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now, every chapter, every verse, you find the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very plain here. What is, where do you see Jesus Christ? Jesus is the bread from heaven. Jesus came from heaven. The Lord's going to rain down bread from heaven. Jesus is the true bread from heaven. And let's look at some things about this bread from heaven. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Verse 24 through 25.
Or look at verse 23. Psalm 78, 23. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. So this manna is angels' food. It's what the angels eat. So angels eat, and you'll eat in your glorified body. Maybe you'll eat all kinds of different angels' food. Who knows? Foods that's not even on earth that that's, that's way better. So they got to eat angels' food. I guess that's where they get angels' food cake from, the, the idea for that. Now look at Psalm 105.40. Psalm 105, verse 40. It says, The people asked, and he brought quails, and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and the waters gushed out. They ran in the dry places like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy, and his chosen with gladness. You see that? He keeps his promises. He takes care of them. You know, the Lord said, Think not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Don't be so worried about that. God's going to take care of you. And if he doesn't, oh well, you can just die and go be with him. So, he rains down bread from heaven. Now, I'm going to show you how the Lord Jesus Christ is pictured by this. Look at John chapter 6, 31 through 32. John 6, 31 through 32. It says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So Jesus is the true bread from heaven. 1 Corinthians 10.3 In 1 Corinthians 10.3 It says, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So that you see all these things that the Lord's given them back there, the bread from heaven, the water from the rock, it's all a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says there, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now this man, it's, all, it's also going to picture the, the written word of God. It pictures the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also a picture of the written word. And notice they had to gather a certain rate every day. When it comes to the Word of God, you need to be getting a certain rate every single day. You need, sometime during the day, you need to open it and get a certain rate. Or you're going to, you're just going to uh, die of hunger spiritually. Just like he's trying to show them, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So gather a certain rate every day, and it shall come to pass, and we're in verse 5, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So prepare that which they bring in. When you gather the word, prepare it. Prepare it to present to somebody else. Get something together to present to somebody else the Word of God. 
So it says, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So if you had an off day, gather twice as much on another day to make up for it. But here, they're doing it because of the Sabbath day. The seventh day was a Sabbath of rest, a sign between them and the Lord. So they they would on the sixth day they would prepare that which they bring in and it shall be twice as much. That way they won't have to do nothing on the Sabbath. Look at sixteen twenty three. In Exodus sixteen twenty three it says, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe. And that which remaineth over, lay it for you to be kept until the morning. So they do; they would do twice as much on the sixth day. That way they would still have that Sabbath rest the next day. And it says in verse 6, And Moses and Aaron said unto, the, said unto all the children of Israel, At even, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. So they will know at even. When he gives them flesh to eat, then they're going to know. Look at verse 8. It says, And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So they're going to know in the evening. That the Lord hath brought them out from the land of Egypt. So when you get the manna, then you sh you shall th know that the Lord hath brought you out. When you yourself get in the Word of God, you're going to know that the Lord has brought you out. When you get in the Bible, then you're going to get some assurance. You're going to have confidence in the Lord. You're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You're not going to get no faith unless you hear the Word of God. Putting it in you all the time. The less Word you put in you, the less faith you're going to have. The less Word you put in you, the less assurance you're going to have. Look at 1 John 5.13. In 1 John 5.13... John says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So you get assurance from the Word. People walk around not having assurance because they don't get in the Word of God. They don't know the doctrines of salvation that would explain to them that they could not lose their salvation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It said, And Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, Even then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. So you read the bread from heaven, and you'll know faith comes by hearing. Now verse 7, And in the morning... Then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? So in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord. Note, underline that, in morning, you'll see the glory. Well, that's a picture of the second coming. The second coming, it, it's like the morning. Look at Malachi 4 and verse 2. In Malachi 4 and verse 2, it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. It says, Shall the Son of Righteousness, a capital S, and it says S-U-N <clears throat> for the S-O-N. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the S-U-N Son pictures him. And at the second coming, here comes the Son of Righteousness. It's going to be like the morning. 
he will be seen when he arises to bring in the kingdom. Look at Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. Isaiah ch chapter 40, 3 through 5. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So there you see, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Just like back in Exodus 16, 7. And, the, and in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord. Now look at Isaiah 35 and verse 2. Isaiah 35, 2. And it shall blossom abundantly. And rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, and the excellency of our God. So, at the second coming, it's going to be the sun of righteousness coming like the morning, and you're going to see the glory of the Lord. So, Exodus 16, 7, And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? So, in the morning, you're going to see the glory. And notice they, uh, Moses said, what are we? You know, their problem's not with Moses. Who's Moses to get mad at? He's just another man. What, am, what is he to get mad at? He's just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. You're really mad at the person that sent the message to the Lord. And you see, you're going to, if you're like Moses, you're going to suffer reproach for the Lord because people are going to be mad at you, but you're just the messenger. Look at verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So they also murmur when the bread of life comes down. The true bread of life comes down. Look at John 6, 41 through 43. John 6, 41 through 43. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this... Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how is it then that he saith, I am came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So you see, they're murmuring back here, and then they're murmuring in John. When the bread comes down, they murmur. They also murmur when the bread of life the Lord Jesus Christ comes down. They're murmuring. Murmuring leads to destruction. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10. It is a complaint uttered in a low voice. Just going around muttering this stuff to yourself. Complaining. And it's against the Lord. John 13.20 John 13.20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. But they're not receiving Moses. They're not receiving Moses and Aaron. They're shooting the messenger. They're against the messenger, but they're really, really they're against the one that gave him the message. They're against the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. So they are despising not the man, but the God who sent the man. Now verse 9, Exodus 16, 9. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say 
and all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. So come near. We need to come near before the Lord. James 4, 8 talks about draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. The Lord has heard their murmurings. Look at Isaiah 59, 1. Isaiah 59, 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. God hears everything. He hears the murmuring, the constant complaining. He hears your prayer that you don't even say with your mouth. He hears every little conversation. He hears the secrets of men. He knoweth the deep and secret things. I mean, every idle word that men shall speak, he's going to give account thereof in the day of judgment. The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. So Moses says, Moses spake unto Aaron, saying to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. He's heard them. So come before the Lord. Look at verse 10. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. So before a written word of God, the Lord spoke directly to people like Moses. And he's appearing in a cloud. You see, today we walk by faith. They walked by faith, but they also had sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7 talks about how me and you, today we walk by faith, not by sight. They had faith, obviously, but they was walking a lot more by sight. And that's because 1 Corinthians 1, 22 says, For the Jews require a sign. They started with signs back there in Exodus 4 when Moses showed up to begin with. And the Lord goes up in a cloud, and he's going to come back with clouds. In Acts chapter 1, they saw him ascend, a cloud received him out of their sight. You get to Revelation 1, what happens? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So it's like when the Lord comes back and forth, he uses those clouds. It's almost maybe there's some type of tele teleportation thing connected with those clouds, and the Lord uses it to go back and forth. Kind of makes you think about the Tower of Babel. They built that Tower of Babel. They weren't trying to reach the third heaven. They were just trying to get to the second heaven where the clouds are. What was they trying to do? So, these clouds. You're going to see the clouds show up in the Bible a lot, especially somebody going back and forth from heaven to earth or communicating from heaven to earth or for example Elijah when he's teleported out of here a whirlwind comes you'll see that whirlwind in connection with the second coming where we have left heaven to come down so the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud and the Lord spake unto Moses saying so the Lord spake unto Moses before a written word of God. The Lord spoke directly to prophets like Moses. It says, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. So they eat flesh. That's, that's the meat of the word. That man of pictures, the word of God, you eat flesh, that's the meat of the word, and be filled with bread. There's your daily devotion. That could picture your daily devotion. And you'll know the Lord. Eat flesh, be filled with bread, and you'll know the Lord. 1 John 5, 13. You'll know that you have eternal life. You'll grow in grace and then in knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as Peter talks about. And you'll have assurance in the morning when you wake up. You go to bed eating the flesh of the word filled with the bread, you'll wake up with a good feeling. You got the facts. You read the word, it gives you faith. And you'll wake up with a good feeling. So in the morning, 
a picture of the Jews at the second coming. Because notice it says in the morning. It says, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speaking to them, saying, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am Lord your God. Remember, in the morning pictures the second coming. And at the second coming, the Jews are going to know that the Lord, he is God. They're going to look on him whom they have pierced, and they're going to know that he's the Lord God in the morning. That's what this pictures. Verse 13, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. So verse 13, the quails. The quails. Look at Numbers 11, 31 through 33. Numbers 11, 31 through 33. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth and the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. So you see, he brings them. He rains them down manna from heaven. He brings them the quails. And they still mess up. Just like us. They still mess up. Back in Exodus 16, 13, it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. You see, the Lord blesses us abundantly. We take it for granted. We still mess up. It says, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. So the dew lays on the ground, and then the manna falls. So that shows you the word isn't dry. People think that the word is dry and dull and boring. It's not dry at all. It's the most exciting thing that there is. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. So here's the manna, a small round thing. It's round. So that pictures the Lord Jesus Christ being eternal. Something that's round, you start at one point of it, and you can just keep going around and around and around. That picture is how the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal. That's like how the bottomless pit that the devil goes to, it could be round. A place that's round, and you just keep falling around and around. It's just bottomless. It just goes on forever. A small round thing. The man of pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is eternal. It pic This pictures the Lord Jesus Christ's humility. A small round thing. See, everything is a picture of the Lord Jesus. But it says, As small as the hoarfrost on the ground. Look at Psalm 147. 147.16. Psalm 147 and verse 16. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. When you're dealing with God, you're dealing with the person that's responsible for snow. Responsible for scattering the hoarfrost like ashes on the ground. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melteth them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. Do you know that you have 24-7 access to the person, the being, who causes snow to fall? Who causes the hoarfrost to be on the ground? And people are looking up to celebrities that don't even know who they are. But yet the Lord 
died for them, and they got 24-7 access to him, and they don't even talk to him. But that hoarfrost back there, it, uh, it's the white particles of ice that's formed by the congelation of dew or watery vapors. But that's what the definition is. I looked up, but really the Lord put it there. How he does it, he just tells it to be there. So the hoarfrost on the ground, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground, So they're picking up, they're going to get this manna off of the ground. They're not worried about a five-second rule. You know, the ground ain't that dirty. It'll be okay. You drop something on the ground, just pick it up and eat it. <clears throat> Verse 15, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Most people can't comprehend Jesus, you know. The man of pictures of the Lord Jesus, and most people can't comprehend the Lord Jesus. When they saw the manna, they said, what is it? They wished not what it was. And that's the way people are with Jesus. You know, they, they either don't get him, don't try to get him, or they don't get him so bad that they get another Jesus. As Paul talks about, some people go around preaching another Jesus because they don't understand the real one. So manna means, what is it? And men don't understand the Lord either. Romans eleven thirty three says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. People don't get the Lord either. They don't understand him. They look at the word of God. They're like, what is it? What is this? The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. They don't get it. So manna means what is it? And verse 16, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. So an omer is the tenth part of an ephah according to Exodus 16.36. Exodus 16.36 says, Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. So if you're like, what's an omer? You look and uh, it says it's the tenth part of an ephah. And I looked that up. That's three quarts and a pint. Now, if you know, well, I, I don't even, I'm not even good with any type of measurements. Maybe you are. So that'll give you an idea of what that is. It says in verse 16, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. Gather of it. And the manna pictures the word. That can picture how you need to get your Bible together. You need to start getting your Bible together in your mind. Get you a, a wide margin Bible. Start on the outside. Work your way in. Get your Bible together. Do an overview of each book. Get you familiar with each book of the Bible. Then go through it verse by verse. Fill in the missing places that are in your mind you don't for example you're reading it and you know what these first five verses are that's in your mind but then you get to verse six and you're like what's that mean fill in the missing spaces in your mind write down what it means the next time you come to it you won't just know what those first five verses mean. You'll know what verse six means. And if you, you just go in order like that, just, just writing something down for every verse that you don't know what it means, by the time you get to the end of that book doing that, you're going to have a really good understanding of that book. Now, obviously, we'll never understand it all, but you need to get it, your Bible together. You need to know what it means or, as, to the best of your ability. 
Now, verse 17, And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more and some less. Just as some read the Bible more and some less than others. And it's, there's no set rule about how much you read. It's different for everybody. Everybody's on a different level of, of growth. And just because this guy reads 100 chapters a day, and this guy reads 10 chapters a day, it, neither one of them is more spiritual than the other. You know, God's got it fixed to where if your heart's r right and your heart's into it, you can get as much reading 10 chapters as you could 100 chapters. Some read the Bible more than others. Some study it more than others. Some memorize it more than others. Some listen to it more than others. If you're doing what you need to do and your heart's in the right place, God's going to give you what you need. It's not about how much you read. It says, And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So it, it says they did meet it, and that's to measure. And I, like I said, a omer, Exodus 16, 36, it says that's the tenth part of an ephah. Just try to gather, and the Lord will give you what you need. Try your best to gather. Get, get into the Word. Get as much of the Word as you can. 19. And Moses said, Let no man leave it till the morning. So read the Word that you need to read today. Then worry about tomorrow when tomorrow comes. Don't put off your reading until tomorrow. <coughs> read your daily Bible reading today. Le let no man leave it till the morning. Don't wait for the next day. Because if you wait for the next day to read, then that day you're going to wait for the next day. Verse 20, Notwithstanding they hearken not unto Moses, but some of them left, it, left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. So it bred worms, picturing the Roman Catholic wafer. And what they could have had the previous day was lost. You see, if you, if you don't read today, you miss a word that God specifically had for you today by putting it off till tomorrow. It says, And they gathered of it, they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. When the sun waxed hot, it melted. So get up early in the morning and just do it. You see, the manna melts. It's the treasures of the snow, as Job 38, 22 talks about. You know, the Word of God en en endures forever, but each time you read it, it's got something different for you. And if you miss it today, then that what it had for you today is gone forever. Get up early in the morning and just do it. Just read it. Verse 22, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. More was given on the sixth day, so that they could rest on the Sabbath day. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Remember the Sabbath, a sign between the nation of Israel and God. And we don't have to keep the Sabbath today. The Lord is our Sabbath. Paul said, in Colossians, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in the respective and holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath day, which is a shadow of things to come. So it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. So more manna is given on the sixth day, and more manna is given on the Sixth day of history, if you think about that. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. 
Do what you need to do today, and it will take care of tomorrow. He said to lay it up. And in Exodus 16:33, it says, And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. The more you lay up of the word today, the more it's going to take care of in the future. And it says, And they laid it up to the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. So when you store up the word, you'll find that it never grows old. God has preserved it without error. The word never grows old. It never goes bad. He's preserved it to without error all the way up till today. And you'll find that it's like a movie. When you were a kid, you could watch that same movie over and over and over and over again. And it never got old. That's the way the Bible is for you now as an adult. You can read the same story over and over again. And it never gets old. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. On the sixth day, he gave the bread of two days. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none, because there's no work to be done on the Sabbath. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. See, they just, pe your people is just going to do whatever they want to do. But it says, and it came to pass that as they went out, some of the people on the seventh day were together and they found none. You see, the seventh day pictures the millennium. Because uh, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And going by that, the millennium will be the seventh day according to God's time. And did you know there's no prophecy in the millennium? According to Zechariah 13, 3, you're not going to have people going around prophesying. So that's what this picture is. They're going out to find manna, a picture of the word, and they found none. If you're in a millennium, you're looking to hear some preaching outside of the Lord, you're going to find none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See that? He's like... How long are you going to be so stubborn and so just full of yourself, hard-headed, not to keep these commandments? And commandments are, are orders that are given with authority. He says, and my laws. Laws are the rules and regulations. And they they refuse to do it. They refuse to do what they're supposed to do. In Proverbs 1, look at Proverbs 1, 24. It says, because I have called... And ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand, no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. You see, you keep refusing and, and being so hard-headed and stubborn, not wanting to listen. Bad things are going to come. Verse 29. See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you... On the sixth day, the bread of two days. Abide ye here, every man in his place, that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. He's like, guys, God's given you the bread of two days on the sixth day. Don't go out together on the seventh day. So it says in verse 30, So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Notice it pictures the Lord. It's white. White pictures purity. When the Lord shows up in Revelation, he's got his hair is white like wool, white as snow. He's got, uh, you know, his clothes are white. It's a picture of purity. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. What's the word of God compared to? Honey. And that's Psalm 119, 103, Revelation 10, 9 through 10. The word of God is like honey. It's like, uh, notice, the, it's like coriander seed. Jesus is the promised seed, Genesis three fifteen. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth, filling over omer of it to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. 
So do something with the word that can be kept for generations. So that people are going to remember what the Lord's done. Psalm 105 and verse 5. Psalm 105 and verse 5. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Do something with the word of God that can be kept up for people to remember. It's like your wide margin Bible. I'm, I'm giving you this lesson out of what I've wrote down in an interleaved Bible. And you can do that and pass it on to somebody else. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. So this manna, in verse 33 that's laid up before the Lord, goes into the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be laid up. So get you some wide margin Bibles laid up for your kids. And <clears throat> 40 years, it says in verse 35, and the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years. So they eat 40 years until they came until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. So 40 years. Then Aaron dies. He dies after 40 years. But this whole time they, they lacked nothing. God took them through it. And they didn't lack anything the whole time. Look at Nehemiah 9, 20 through 21. Nehemiah 9, 20 through 21. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth, and gave us them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. What a, what a story. Just there in chapter 16, how the Lord took care of Egypt, brought them manna from heaven. And the Lord has given you the manna from heaven. That's the word of God. Gather it every day. If you miss a day, gather twice as much the next day to make up for it. So that's Exodus chapter 16.